Good morning. It's new mug day. The good people over at the Edge of Faith magazine redid the mugs with bigger lettering and it just makes the coffee taste so much better. Today we want to look at how the New Testament was written. When we talk about ancient letters, we need to realize just how important they were. Today we have TV, radio, newspapers, email, text messaging, social media, and finally letters themselves. In the ancient world, when a person received a letter, they would have received it with a great deal of importance and significance. It would raise their hopes, expectations of news, and perhaps some anxiety or anticipation as well. Letters were special. The average person never sent one or received one. Only the wealthy and those who were socially significant would have received letters. This doesn't mean that the average person was not addressed in letters. Quite the contrary. Oftentimes a letter was addressed to a group, a household, a trade guild, city or town, or in the case of the New Testament, churches. So how did someone write and then send letters like Paul does to all of his churches? You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching at seminaries across the globe and make it available to anyone on YouTube. So if you like these videos, please subscribe, give them a thumbs up and smash that share button and let somebody else know about them. This channel takes a lot of work to produce and that's a small way that you can help me out. Thanks. Today we're looking at how letters were written during the time of the New Testament. When we lived in England, we had the chance to hike across Hadrian's Wall, which divides England from Scotland east to west. Emperor Hadrian built this wall on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire in England to keep those loathsome Picts and Scots from raiding their territory. One of the forts or settlements along Hadrian's Wall is the town of Vindolandia. In the ruins of Vindolandia, they found these very, very thin wooden tablets that were used for writing letters on from around 100 AD. The ones in Vindolandia were almost paper thin and the scribe would score the middle of the wooden tablet down the middle. Then they had two columns on which to write on and when they were done, they could fold the tablet in half and seal it before sending it to the other person. More common were thicker pieces of wood that were bound or sewn down the edge to make sort of a booklet. They would coat the inside of the wood with chalk so that when they wrote on it with pen and ink, it would show up better. A step up from this were wooden tablets that would then be coated with a thin layer of wax on the inside. The scribe could take notes on this with a stylus as the author dictated their letter or their text. After taking notes, the scribe would then transfer their notes in final form to the papyrus or other material to create the final letter. They could then take a hot iron and smooth out their wax so that they could reuse it for taking notes again. Sort of like the first iPad. Now papyrus was the primary writing medium from that day. It was invented around 1800 to 1500 BC in Egypt. And unless someone was very wealthy or a government official, papyrus was the day-to-day -day medium that was used. Papyrus comes from the Greek word papyros, where we get our English word paper from. If it was a long document, the papyrus could be joined together to create a scroll. The Greek word for this was chartas, where we get our word for chart or card from. These papyrus scrolls could be a few feet up to 15 feet long. And I've got a piece of papyrus here that I'll show you in more detail when we get to the actual process of how they wrote it. When a scribe was creating the final copy of a letter, they would simply write out the letter and then cut the scroll to the length once it was finished. So if it was a long letter, let's say four pages long, they would have a long scroll, start at the beginning, write through, and when the letter finished, they could just cut their scroll there and that's how they got to the perfect length. Paul's letters to the Romans or 1st and 2nd Corinthians could have easily fit on like a 15 foot long scroll. An example of this is found in the Greek translation of the book of Jeremiah, where pas ha kartos refers to the entire scroll. 
Now papyrus was made from the papyrus plant, a reed that grew along the Nile River and a few other places. They would soften up the reed by chewing it, mashing it, or keeping it in a pit of water for a while. Once softened up, it was cut in strips and then laid on a flat surface. The reeds would be laid in two layers at 90 degrees to each other, and you can see in this one here how we've got the two different reeds laid at 90 degrees to each other. It would then be pounded flat, and after that, it would be left in the sun to dry. The starch that came out of the papyrus plant when they mashed it up would then serve as the glue that would bind it all together. Once it was dry, they would take a smooth stone or a small bag with some pumice in it, and they would smooth out the writing side of the papyrus. Rarely did they write on the back side though. But occasionally, if someone needed to take some notes or write down something, they would use old letters or documents to take those notes on. When John tells us in Revelation 5.1 that he saw that the one who was seated on the throne took a scroll written on the front and the back, and it was sealed with seven seals. But the fact that this piece of papyrus or this scroll was written on both sides let you know that it was a very, very expensive document. This was not the day-to-day -day type papyrus that everybody would have been familiar with. It would have been very high quality. We're very grateful that Pliny the Elder described the entire process of how they made papyrus during that days in his natural history. And I'll include a link to his writings in the show more section underneath the video. So who could read and write? If someone was a man and came from the upper class background, we could assume that they learned to read and write in grammar school. However, it wasn't the case that someone was either literate or illiterate. There were all levels of ability to read and write in between. However, the ability to actually write a letter was definitely a skill and a trade that not many possessed. Actually writing on papyrus with pen is very, very difficult and it's a tricky skill. I've tried it. Going back to Vindulandia, archeologists have found an extensive body of correspondence between one of the officer's wives and other women. And most likely if you were sending a letter to a friend, you may have tried your hand at writing it yourself. However, in this particular case, she used a trained scribe. And we'll get to that in a bit. But if your letter was important, say it was a business contract, government business, you would employ a scribe to do the work for you. Even Paul used scribes in every one of his letters when he wrote his letters to the different churches, and he often mentions them in his letters. When riots broke out in Ephesus over Paul's teachings there, the book of Acts tells us that the town clerk got the mob to quiet down. And really in Greek, the word for this is scribe, and it indicates the high role that this person played as a scribe within the city council. So what did they write with? Now a cheap stylus would have been made from a reed. They would just cut the end of it and then dip it in the ink and write with that. A professional scribe would have most likely had a metal stylus. And if he was a time traveling, he would have had an apple pencil. But I digress. The ink would have been kept primarily as a dry powder and mixed up in small batches in an ink pot. Now most of these ink pots or wells that archeologists have found could easily fit in the palm of your hand with your hand rolled up. Black ink was the most common color of ink. They would have used red ink for important names or perhaps the name of a deity. The color of the black ink was taken from either soot, iron vitriol, shoemakers even today use iron vitriol to dye leather black. Or perhaps the scribe had discovered their own personal mix for how to make that black ink. This is why I use fountain pens, because they're biblical. Now, if you were educated enough to actually be able to write, you may have had yourself a little writing kit. These were small little leather pouches that contained the inkwell, the pen, maybe a knife or something to sharpen the pen with, and they may have had the dried ink as well. These would have been the prized life possession of a scribe. If someone could write, they often had their writing kits buried with them. When Bloomberg News was digging the foundation for their new building in London, they found an old Roman burial site. Among the graves, 
they discovered almost 200 pens among the deceased. So you can see that this was a valued treasure within their life, and it was something that they consider important enough to bury with those who died. In the New Testament, we see evidence of the use of scribes by authors at various locations. The Jewish scribes that you meet throughout the Gospels would have been highly trained men who not only copied the Jewish scrolls, but would have been used to write business contracts, read letters that someone else had sent to you, or perhaps military correspondence. When John recounts Jesus' death on the cross, you have this strange interjection. In John 1935, it says, He who saw it bore witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth that you may believe. Now, what's going on here? Why is the author now referred to in the third person, he or him? I think the best explanation is the scribe is adding their own two cents here to tell you that John's teachings can be trusted. Another place where we see an interjection from the scribe is in Romans 16, when Paul is giving all of his greetings to the various people in Rome. In it, you get this interjection where it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Here we see the scribe himself sending his own personal greetings within the letter. For an important letter, like one of Paul's letters to the churches, these were probably dictated by Paul with the scribe taking notes on one of the wax tablets. The scribe would then either do a better copy of those on another tablet or perhaps a rough draft on papyrus. They would then take this sort of rough final draft and pass it by Paul to see if there were any changes or corrections that would be made. Then the final version would be committed to papyrus. They would take their papyrus and pin it down on the four corners on a piece of wood, sort of like a desk surface. They would then carefully write out the letter in all capitals with no breaks, no small letters, and no spaces between the words or punctuation during the time of Paul. Punctuation and other grammatical stylistic features would not come along for another 100 to 200 years. Oftentimes, the person who dictated the letter would then sign the end of the letter like we do today. If we go back to the letter from Vindolandia, we can see that most of the letter is written in very, very nice handwriting. But down here in the lower right corner, you see smaller and different type of lettering. This is the woman who actually dictated the letter, putting her sort of personal touch at the very end. It's a lot like we sign letters today. We'll print them out from the computer and then sign it with the pen at the end to make it far more or more personal. In Colossians 4.18, we see evidence that Paul did the same thing at the end of this letter. I, Paul, write this green with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So you can see that the scribe has probably written the letter, and then the very final verses, Paul picks up the stylus on the finished version of the letter on papyrus and writes his own greeting at the very end. It's even more pronounced at the end of Galatians. In Galatians 6.11, Paul writes, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. This is from the English Standard Version. I have an image here from Ferguson's Backgrounds of Early Christianity. And this is a great example of a papyrus and probably what the church at Galatia saw when Paul says, See with what big letters I'm writing to you. A professionally transcribed letter from the scribe would have been the main body of the document. And then at the very end, Paul would have picked up the pen with his own hand and written the last few lines. And the difference between the two letter styling and the styles of writing would have been readily apparent. As Paul calls their attention to, see with what big letters I am writing. He was probably not nearly as skilled at writing letters as the scribe that he's using. Now, unless you were a government official or military commander, there was no postal system to send your letters through. Rather, they relied on friends, acquaintances, or business contacts to send a letter. In other words, you needed to know someone going to that location to send a letter with them. Oftentimes, the letter carrier was someone the author and the scribe may have known. So they would have been briefed on the contents of the letter. This way, they could either read the letter to the recipient 
And remember, these letters were all capped with no spaces or punctuation. So they needed to know the content of it so that they could break the words and ideas at the correct locations. They would also serve as sort of a representative for the author. If the reader had a question, the letter carrier could then answer on the behalf of the author. In the New Testament, the best example of this is found at the end of the book of Romans. In chapter 16, Paul gives his greetings and well wishes to the church there at Rome from the people at Corinth. But look what it says right at the start in Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Crentia. That was one of the small port cities in Corinth that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well." So why is Phoebe being mentioned first in Paul's greetings here at the end of the letter of Romans? I think it's to give her some street cred. Paul most likely sent this letter to the Romans by Phoebe's hand. And we get some clues about her in these verses. First, she was a wealthy individual. She was able to travel from Corinth to Rome. It's also interesting to note that there is no male chaperone or patron mentioned in connection to her. She may have been like Lydia, who Paul met at Philippi and was a wealthy woman in her own regard. The fact that Paul says that she had been his patron and many others substantiates this. Second, Paul tells them to provide whatever she may need. This may be a way to help repay her for conveying his letter to them. She may be looking for business contacts, a safe place to stay, or other needs associated with her trip to Rome. And finally, as Paul's letter carrier, she would have been the person most likely to read the letter to them the first time, and then would have been Paul's representative to answer any questions they may have about the contents of the letter which we are still asking questions about to this day. One final point to note is that Paul's activity as a letter writer sheds a couple of clues on his ministry. First off, Paul cultivated and made use of a network of close friendships and relationships between various churches. As a result, he had a number of letter carriers available for him to carry out his ministry by correspondence. Second, one of the reasons why Paul spends so much time in larger cities like Corinth or Ephesus is because of their travel networks. For example, Phoebe is from Corinth, but she had the money, time, and network to travel from Corinth to Rome. But if Paul had his ministry in Galilee like Jesus did, he would not have had access to the same network to send and receive letters. Letters in the ancient world were very different than ours today. They were difficult to write. They required a high level of education and training to produce one. And you did not have a post office to send them safely to the other person. At the same time, all of these features help us to understand the letters and other documents that make up the New Testament. I would love to hear what clues or evidence you find as you read through the New Testament that shed light on these letter writing practices. And there's a lot of them. If you find some, please leave it in the comments down below. Or if you found this video particularly enlightening in a certain aspect, I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well in the comments. Next week, I plan to focus on the style and composition of ancient Greco-Roman letters and how this shapes the way the letters of the New Testament should be read today. Till then, peace. Oh, 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 oh. As I was finishing this up, I came across a site on the internet which sells little kits that you can order to make your own papyrus, not like the one I bought. I'll include a link to this kit in the description underneath this video. It only costs about $10 and I already ordered one. I might have to make a video of that as well. Perhaps a group project with my grandkids maybe. Until next week, again. Peace. Now here's an important distinction for you to learn. Wheat then, papyrus. Don't mix the two up.